Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along to this webinar today, looking at safe driving. Um, it's a responsible thing to do when we're out on the roads. So many of you will be doing the daily commute, like myself, um, or you may be driving for work, or you may be just driving for pleasure at the weekends, driving with your family and friends. So today's session is really to help us all to think about how can we drive more responsibly, more carefully, um, so that we can prevent accidents on the road and ultimately prevent road deaths. So in our session um, today, um, we have a number of speakers who are going to share some information with you and then we're going to give you some top tips at the end and we'll share some information by email with you tomorrow as well. So my name is Helen Bowman um, I work for business in the community in the communications department um, and at business in the community we have members across Northern Ireland who are involved with us in a whole range of programs and initiatives but our members actually employ 40% of the workforce here in Northern Ireland so many of our members have employed employees and colleagues who are driving on a daily basis and that's why we feel it's so important to deliver this session to you today. Um, after I've said a little bit then I'm going to hand over to Sam Donaldson who is the Chief Superintendent and is very aware of the things that are happening on the roads for people across Northern Ireland. Then we're going to hear a little bit about um, a lived experience from Stephen Kelly. Some of you in this group may already know Stephen. He is the chief executive of Manufacturing NI, but unfortunately has had a, a bad experience of things that have happened um, on the roads with a family member. And we'll also hear from Peter McFerry, who's talking about some of the campaigning that we're doing around the Fatal Five that you'll be able to hear on the radio over the next few weeks. And then some questions and answers. Um, if you've got anything that you'd like to ask any one of our speakers today, then we'll be happy to answer those questions or go away and find out the answers for you and respond. So we should be done and dusted um, before three o'clock. I hope everybody enjoys the session. If you've got a question that you want to ask or a comment that you want to make, you please do use the chat function and we'll pick up on those um, as best we can. My colleague Marie is also on here as well. So she's going to be able to look at some of those questions for us as well. So um, I don't know about you all, but I'm ready to get started because I have a teenager, nearly nearly 20, who has just bought his first car and he is ready to go on the road. Um, so every time I'm in the car with him, I'm saying, please be careful, please be careful, please watch out for this, please watch out for that. Now he's had to pay for everything himself. So he's going to be much more cautious, I think, on the roads. And I have another one who is just starting to learn to drive. So um, if any of your parents here, um, it's a hairy, scary place to be whenever your children get in that car and they've, they're literally in charge of a life and death situation. So I'm really interested to hear what's going on. Before we start the session, um, I want to just try to run a little poll with you. And um, we start back onto this. If you've got your phones close by, um, please do join on our Mentimeter. So any technical problem here? So if you look at, let me move all your lovely boxes out of the way. If you look at this slide and you have your phone handy, please scan that code and it should bring you into just a little survey where we're going to ask some questions that hopefully will help guide us in how we're able to help everybody today, but also get an understanding of maybe some of the concerns that you have as well. So technology, let me switch back out of this. And if you're in there, if you've used the QR code, um, you should see something like this on your screen. Um, if you need the details of the Mentimeter again, let me just see, um, you can join at menti.com and put in the code 87953754. Okay. That little code should stay at the top the whole time anyway. So if you've got your, if you're connected into Menti, um, maybe you could give us your answers to these questions. Do you drive for work? Do you drive to work or do you drive to and from work? Let's give me a second there. I think we're about 15 or 16 responses so far. Okay, so next question is, 
Do you know how many people died on the roads in Northern Ireland in 2023? What do you think? 67, 71, 92. Even one is too many, isn't it? So, let's see, we've got about 24 people have answered there. Well, since you're here, Sam, do you want to give us the answer? Yeah, the sad answer is 71. And uh, the answer that you've just said, zero is the target. It's always been the target and always will be. Yeah, so 71 people. Imagine if, if one of those was your family member. You just never get over that at all. So next question. Now, hmm. disclaimer, we don't know who answers these questions. So um, if you've ever done a speed awareness course, let us know. Oh, some very good people here. Never had to do one. I'm going to admit it. I've had to do it. Um, I feel like I should always say in advance that I was doing 37 and a 30, and I know that's too fast. I appreciate that that's too fast. But actually, the speed awareness course was amazing. Um, the the person that was delivering the course was so no judgmental when he could have been, and um, just really gave me some tips and hints of things that I hadn't really thought about since I've been driving for a few decades. Okay. Next question. Now, these are not things that you have done, okay? So don't get scared and say, oh, somebody's going to know that I lifted my phone. These are not things that um, you have actually done in the car. But have you ever been tempted to do any one of these things? So years ago, I think whenever I first started driving, I think it was acceptable to have a drink and then be able to drive home. You had your limits that you were allowed to have. So, you know, you can't do that. Anybody that's been in the speed awareness course is maybe going to answer yes <laughs> we tend to speed a little get distracted and um, we have one of our other colleagues from PSNI here today um, who talked about having two little kids in the car can be very distracting for us forget to put on your seatbelts probably unlikely um, now, nowadays because we've all the, the little things that bing in our cars to stop us from doing that um, or reach for your phone so that's been a it's, it's something that um, I know the police service have been campaigning on they're campaigning on again as part of the fatal five but it's just so tempting to do isn't it it's just there and you're used to having it attached to you okay so what do you hope to get out of today's session so what are some of the things that you would like to find out about we've discovered how many people died on the roads last year so what are the things that you would like to find out about either personally for your own driving or if you drive for work, what are some of the things that you are conscious of that you might need to do yourself? So we've got here, make a change to my driving. Yeah. Info for your team. Yeah. We're going to send some information out after this session too. Awareness, really important. How to improve my driving. Yeah. Interestingly, whenever I knew I was doing this session, I went on and had a bit of a delve to see what it, what it would take to do the next phase up um, in terms of driving. So that's something that I'm investigating. More stats, yeah, stats tell the story, don't they? There's a person behind every single statistic, but the stats actually are the things that go in our minds. You know, we went to a session with Road Safety and I with um, Peter from U105 last year when they were talking about the number of people who had died on the roads and I was horrified. I really did not think that that was that number of people. So we'll take this little section and we will try to develop um, some other information to come out to you, our members, uh, to help you with some of the things that we're looking at here. So Help a younger driver. Yeah, I'm in that camp. Drive safe tips. Yeah, info for your team. Managing distractions. It's easy to be complacent. Absolutely. Improve our habits. And I think that's one of the things that all of us are conscious about, that you get into maybe a not so good driving habit. And really, we want to try and make our driving habits a lot better. So thank you all for your contributions there. And let me just switch back into our presentation. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to Sam now, who's going to um, make us all think about things. Let me just see. Here we go. Okay, Sam, hand over to you. Okay, um, folks, good afternoon. Um, Sam Donaldson, I'm a chief super in the police service in Northern Ireland, and I have the grand title of being the gold lead in the police service for trying to reduce. Uh, the carnage that is going on on our roads at the minute, folks. So can I say, first of all, thank you very much to the business and the community and to U105 
uh, for the opportunity to do this. I do have a colleague with me, Bruno's here from our corporate comms, strategic comms team as well. So it's great to get an opportunity to engage with so many people. I wouldn't have known the stat around 40% of workers. So there's an opportunity. And I really, really plead with you folks, some of the information that you hear today and some of the information I shared with you later on, please communicate it to your colleagues, your family, your friends, uh, and, and things like that. Um, you used the word scary as well uh, earlier on, Helen. And I can recall, I've got a son of 24, and I'm not just saying this, the scariest moment in my life was when my 17-year-old son, who just passed his test, got into my car and drove off on his own in my car. I've never been so scared in my life. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that we want to chat about today. And lastly, can I say, um, I will have some powerful messages here for you, but there'll be none more powerful than what Stephen's about to tell you. Uh, and if you forget everything that I say, don't worry about it. Listen to Stephen and listen to the consequences from a family uh, perspective. So in order to set the scene a little bit, um, I'm going to read out two very, very brief scenarios. Hopefully on your screen, you can see three questions. Um, these are not real, um, so don't be trying to identify where exactly these came from, um, but they're my experience, the Brona's experience, the kind of things that people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So Catherine is a 43-year-old senior manager. She has two kids. They're doing okay, but one of them is really struggling in school at the minute. Her partner's a senior manager. He struggles a lot with his work too, and he's currently away on business. He travels an awful lot. So Catherine's under a lot of pressure. Her line manager is currently off sick, and she's covering both jobs. I'd be pretty sure lots of you are relating to this right now. Um, she's under a lot of pressure in work at the minute to deliver on a project. Uh, and she's delivering a presentation this afternoon, and she's got to get it absolutely right. So she spent the morning in a number of meetings. She's now in the car. And the staff are on the phone trying to finalize the presentation to get it absolutely right. She does use the same phone for home and work. And her daughter's been on the phone as well. And the daughter's having a really, really hard day in school. And a few tears have been shed. She's trying to get through to mommy at the same time. Um, so Catherine's on her way to work. Let's be honest and say she's probably not 100% focused on her driving. She's got a lot going on in the background. She's going a little bit fast because she's running a little bit late. Um, and she's on the phone. Daughter's just sent her a text. She needs to reply. It's only one text. It's only going to take a few moments to send that text. Uh, bang, crash, smash, whatever word you want. Um, a pensioner has just stepped off the footpath. She has been, she has struck the pensioner with her car. Police and ambulance are at the scene. The pensioner has horrifically been pronounced dead. Uh, and my question to you is, could that possibly be you? Um, how would you feel that moment of inattention? And it'll be on the news that night, and Peter and his colleagues will be conveying it, but it's more than a statistic. It's more than a headline, because a number of families have just been horrifically sent into a free fall. The second one is uh, about Leslie, and Leslie can be a boy or a girl, but Leslie's coming 18. Leslie's a good kid, but is keeping some bad company at the minute. Um, they like to socialize and does so through a local sports club that they're heavily involved in. Um, Leslie's the only one in their peer group that has access to a car right now. And again, I'd be pretty sure that some of you folks can relate to this. The team has just won a major game. They're in celebrating. And Leslie, just because a little bit of peer pressure, has had one drink, just one drink. Uh, it's home time. There are four others in the car. Uh, the crack's absolutely great, but nobody in the back is wearing a seatbelt. Leslie's not, again, 100% focused on their driving. It's pitch dark. We're on a rural road. It's cold and wet. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have another crash. Bang, smash. Um, they've left the road. The car is upside down in the field. And Leslie is the only one who appears to be alive. And their personal screams for silence. That, sorry, their personal screams are the only sound that Leslie can hear. And my question to you is, could this be your child? How would you feel? 
gain that moment of inattention. And we'll, we'll chat later on, perhaps, around the different elements. Um, but I want to say, folks, those are not uh, the kind of things that don't happen on our roads. Those are the kind of things that are happening on our roads every single day. Those are the kind of things that my police officers and ambulance colleagues and fire service colleagues have to go to. And they're also the kind of things that um, you have to turn up, you have to deal with it, and you have to get through the carnage that's facing you. And then all of a sudden you have to go to a family and knock the door and completely destroy their world. So just wanted to set those scenes um, at the start. I do have some statistics here um, around road safety in Northern Ireland over the last number of years. Hopefully you can see that now, but if you were to go back to the 1970s, um, and I can remember the 1970s, just about, um, but there were about 314 people dying on our roads every single year on average in the 1970s. In the 1980s, that went down to 201. The 1990s, down to 155. And you can see it on your screen there. But I think the point I want to make is if you go from the 70s to about the early 2000s, there's definitely a significant reduction. And uh, you may remember things like seatbelt laws changing. You may remember the implementation of road safety vans and all the stuff that's happened. But for about 20 years now, we've been stuck in and around high 50s, um, maybe into the 60s. And last year we did have 71. So that's the answer to that question, obviously. And 71 is an eight year high. So I'm a little bit concerned as a society that we've plateaued. And um, if you haven't already heard of the road to zero, that, that is our objective. That's what we're aiming for. And the police service, along with many, many other agencies, are, are, are working to try and get us as close to zero as possible. Uh, my view is we've still a lot of work to do. We talk about the three E's, by the way. Um, that's education, engineering, and enforcement. And I think some people think that the police are just about enforcement. But today is not about enforcement. Today is not about engineering. Today is certainly about education and if i can do one thing today and communicate a message around the risks to you on the roads the decisions you have to make the responsibility that you have to consider um, that's what today is all about i want to educate you around your personal responsibility i want to educate you around the consequences that are potential when you're behind um, the wheel of a vehicle i want to share a few slides with you here uh, just to finish as well, and Bruno, who's with me today, Bruno's been working really, really hard around what we're calling our more than a statistic campaign. So, yes, we've um, we've communicated the fatal five, and I'm happy to take questions in those. They almost speak for themselves, and I'll finish with those in a second. But without speaking, I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you here. I'll just take a moment to read them and see if the message is thinking in, is sinking in. We had a chat about six months ago about how we've been communicating road safety. And I'm very much of the view that we've been trying to be nice. We're trying to plead with people. We've been almost begging them and saying, could you please slow down? And on occasions, we've been almost apologizing for catching people speeding and apologizing for repeater vans and apologizing for people getting caught drink driving. And I think we're moving into another phase here, folks. And I think that in order to drive that's 71 down as close to zero as we can possibly get it in the coming years. Uh, we want to be a little bit more hard hitting. And that's why we're communicating messages like more than a statistic, because when the police go to that door, um, the family don't care about the statistic. Um, it's so much more than that. It's life changing stuff. And when it comes to the fatal five, and I'll finish with this, by the way, um, from a drunk driving perspective, I am sad to say that despite all our messages before Christmas, 300 people were caught drink driving in December alone. 300 in December alone. From a speeding perspective, the road safety vans alone caught 80,000 people speeding on our roads last year. In the year 2023, 80,000 people caught speeding on our roads. And the vast majority of those do get the offer of the speed awareness course but many don't. From a careless perspective, um, I do recall being taught as a very young constable that you will never deal with a collision. You'll never go to an accident 
where there isn't some degree of carelessness involved. But statistically, about 55% of our collisions, we can absolutely say, have involved some form of inattention, some kind of distraction, some kind of carelessness. And then from a seatbelt perspective, I can still recall um, the time when it wasn't important to wear your seatbelt. I'm sure I was conveyed to and from school and youth organizations when I didn't have a seatbelt on. That is now a cultural abnormality, but there are sadly still people who don't wear their seatbelt. And if you forget everything I say about seatbelts, I'll simply say this. If you are involved in a collision, a seatbelt will save your life. Full stop. And it's no more simple than that. And then the use of phones and technology, and we'll maybe talk later about our vehicles and how our vehicles have changed as well. Um, but I would almost describe it as an epidemic now. I can drive into work and I'm sure you can do the same. And it's not very difficult to see people on their telephones, on their devices. And arguably that's just careless driving. It's just inattention, but it's one of our fatal five. And I want to get those messages across today. So thanks, Helen, for the opportunity. Thanks, Peter, for the opportunity as well. Happy to take questions later on. That's great. Um, thank you so much, Sam. Um, when you're reading those two examples, I thought, that's me. That's, I'm the first one, you know, and then you read the second one. It's like, that's my son. You know, he's the second one. So the reality is that, you know, that's what we're facing. And whilst I might get away with it on one occasion and somebody else doesn't, I might not have got away with it on another occasion. So I think the statistics really do, you know, kind of reveal what's what's going on. So I'd like to introduce um, Stephen Kelly now. Um, so as I the fatal five are the we'll play that to you a little bit later. Um, so Stephen is managing director or chief executive of um, manufacturing at MI. So Stephen might be familiar to some people in this group. Um, but Stephen, we know that you've had uh, a terrible experience of something that happened on the roads. So do you want to just introduce yourself? and then maybe share what happened and what the impact has been for you and your family. Hi, good afternoon, Helen and uh, Sam. Uh, yes, I'm Stephen Kelly. I'm Chief Executive of Manufacturing in Northern Ireland. We're a representative body on behalf of our manufacturing community, some 100,000 people employed in every city, town and townland across Northern Ireland. Uh, our role is to work with them, uh, businesses, to try to make sure that uh, they have an environment in which they can operate successfully, employ more people, selling more stuff globally, and as a result, having a stronger economy and stronger communities. As you say, Helen, back in 31st of August, 1995, my father, just like hundreds and thousands of other people, even this morning, left and went to his work uh, in a construction site in Oma, we live in Derry in the northwest, and obviously that's a very hard physical day's work. They was returning home in the work van uh, as a passenger with a, a young apprentice as the, the driver. Long summer days, not that we get too tropical conditions, but it was still a, a long, hard day's work in, in, the, in the heat of the summer. And uh, on the A5, which is a very contemporary road that a lot of people are talking about at the moment, uh, they were traveling a row of traffic and uh, we believe the young apprentice drifted off very briefly. I uh, hadn't paid attention, had fallen asleep maybe momentarily as a result of uh, working hard all day and driving that distance back. The van left the road. Uh, the young apprentice had uh, a number of stitches in the top of his head, but my father suffered catastrophic injuries and died instantly uh, in the van. Uh, where he was, that kind of took off, uh, sorry, that kind of instigated a whole series of things that were happening. I was still a young man at the time. It was the eldest child in the family. My mother was away from home uh, at an at a entertainment event down in, in Dublin. Uh, but you then have to kind of deal with all the real practical stuff. So the police officers came to the home. I had to go and identify my father's body. I uh, had to begin informing people, had to begin uh, going around the family and had to put in, in motion just all the practical stuff around funerals and uh, where he'd be buried, contacting uh, undertakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as a young man, it was a pretty 
difficult 72 hours, to say the least. Uh, but despite the fact that that was a difficult 72 hours, we have a brilliant thing in our in our Northern Irish culture of the wake where people gather around and give you support and get you through those kind of initial few days. But the period beyond that is where it's most difficult uh, for everybody involved. I still see from time to time that little maroon coloured van that my father had and 28 years later still believe that, oh, that's him coming back home from his work. Uh, obviously, we lost the main income into our family, which created quite significant difficulties for my mother, just keeping a house running with three children. Uh, and uh, just the, the, the trauma and the loss and the difficulties that that losing someone on the roads has on the entire family circle is is quite quite challenging, and even twenty eight years later, I uh, we miss him deeply. Of course we do. Uh, I still meet people who now know me that didn't realize that was my father. So this is something that's brought up all the time. I uh, and he's lost. I uh, we lost him, but he's also lost so much of his own. I. Uh, the only experiences that he should have had. He was 45 years of age when he passed away. He didn't get to see any of his children marry. He didn't get to see any of his grandchildren. And obviously he lost the love in terms of his uh, his wife and his family home. So at this point in time in life, he should have been a, a doting grandfather, probably retired. But instead, we lost him at 45 years of age, prime uh, in terms of his age and his working life. And so that momentary brief I uh, lack of attention I uh, caused has and continues to cause 28 years worth of hurt uh, and pain for all involved. And that's just one story of 71 of those people last year have had the same experience and thousands of people over the last number of years have had the same experience. Loss is not easy. Loss is incredibly difficult. And anything we can do and should do to try to avoid that is definitely worth trying. Thanks, Stephen. You know, I think any of us who have our parents still, you know, would just ever, never ever want to take them for granted. You know, whenever you hear a story like yours and um, losing your dad on the roads, you know, for that young apprentice then as well as the driver of that van, like his life must have been changed forever too. Sure, it has. Uh, we we saw him for uh, obviously during the week. He was an incredibly distraught young man. I, I can't say that I know him today, not because of any particular reason. It's just drifted apart and we, we haven't seen him for a while. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's incredibly difficult for our family, but also incredibly difficult for him as well. And, and in an ironic type of way, I mean, I've just returned back from a weekend away with some friends. Uh, and two of my friends that were on that trip, one of them was two cars directly behind my father's van whenever it left the road. And the ambulance driver that was called to deal with the scene after the, the accident has now become one of my best friends. Now, that wasn't a deliberate thing. Uh, we become friends and it was five years later that we realized actually what it, where the connection was. Uh, but talking to both of those people, I mean, they're, they're still, they can still recall the scenes that they saw. Uh, difficult for them and difficult for uh, their families to have to deal with as well. And I'm sure it's the same for Sam and his colleagues being called to some horrendous uh, scenes. I, I still actually recall the police officer coming to our door uh, that evening to tell me, and he was upset, uh, despite the fact that uh, he wasn't directly involved and he hadn't even been to the scene. But someone has to do all these incredibly difficult jobs, meeting people, giving them incredibly difficult and challenging uh, messages. Uh, and if we can do anything to avoid any of that, not just for the individual families involved, but the, the people around all of this, then that has to be a good thing too. So changing tack slightly, you know, and you've been very, very open and honest about your own personal experience, but you also have a responsibility for the members um, of Manufacturing and I who work with you on a, a, on a day and daily basis. What is it, what message would you give to your members um, that we would also share with business and the community members. What is it? What are the things that you would say to the companies that you work with um, if you talk about responsible driving then? Well, my father just went to his work as a normal man that morning, fully expecting to come home, to get a bite of food, 
the great training for football. He, he trained the local football team. Uh, he didn't expect to leave work and leave behind a widow and and three children. Uh, and, and that's the same for everybody in our workforce. We want them to come to work. We want them to work safely whilst they're in work. And that working safely also is extended to their journey to and from work and their journey uh, to and from clients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Fatal Five is a, a really simple, memorable thing that we as leaders of businesses or people that have other people under our responsibility uh, can take to them to have a conversation with them, print the posters out, put them on notice boards, introduce it in as part of training that you're you're involved in, share them socially within your uh, within your own family and groups, share them uh, by email around your colleagues and offices and in the work place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we, can, if we can address these fatal five and just remind people about how important paying attention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, actually is, then, then that might actually help uh, many people avoid some potential catastrophe further along. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's been really good to have you with us today. I know you're just back actually from, from leave. So thank you for coming on and doing the webinar with us today. And I think we all want to learn from your example. Not that there's anything that you could have done to stop what happened to your dad, but there are things that we can do as drivers to maybe not put somebody else's family in that circumstance. So thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. And we will share um the stuff that we send out to our members with you as well. So just thought it would be good to do a little reminder on what the Fatal Five actually are. So let's just have a look at these and Sam, you join in with me here. Um, so talk us through what the Fatal Five actually are. Yeah, so we need to be really clear, the Fatal Five are certainly not what we want you to do. The Fatal Five, just to be clear, are the reasons or the main reasons why people are dying on the roads. Um, this is not new. Um, some police services in England have been using the Fatal Four for some years, and we thought it was a really good idea to try and put this together. So just to be really clear, um, Helen, these are about the things that you can do to keep yourself safe on the road. And if you can avoid the Fatal Five is probably the language, or teach other people to avoid the Fatal Five, or, or if you see somebody behaving in a way that looks like it's a breach of the Fatal Five. I'm starting to sound like a police officer now. But um, think about the Fatal Five as the things you absolutely have to avoid. And when I take that drink driving and stuff, again, it wasn't that long ago that it was okay to have a drink and get behind the wheel of a car. Um, I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people in society don't accept that anymore. Um, sadly, some people still do accept it. Um, but sometimes people will say to me, how many drinks is it okay to have? And I, near, I, I go to 100,000 feet when I hear that. The answer is none. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none. And people will say, is it okay to have one or two or whatever? And that's why this scenario was thrown in there about Leslie. He just had one. Mm, yeah. But zero is the answer. Uh, when you look at slow down, you know, I, I would be a hypocrite if I said, Helen, today, that I've never driven above the speed limit. Every single one of us have driven above the speed limit but it's about the consequences of that speed. And I need people to think through, if I'm doing 37 in a 30, or I'm doing 47 in a 40, what does that actually mean? And there's loads of statistics and loads of evidence now around the difference that driving at 30 and driving at 40 can actually make. That was make. one of the things from that course that really hit me, was just, just one mile of a difference. Yeah. And your speed can mean life or death for somebody. Yeah, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but it's something like if you get hit at 30, 30 miles per hour, the chances of you surviving are something like 70%. But if you get hit at 40 miles per hour, the chances of you surviving are something like 5%. Please don't quote me in those stats because yeah. I, don't, I don't have them in front of me. But there's a mind-blowing difference between 30 and 40 when it comes to pedestrians. And then when it comes to this careless thing, like as I said earlier on, we all drive in a way on a day-to-day -day basis that is not 100% focused on what we do. Who on the screen has ever driven from location A to location B and gone, how did I get here? And that's because you've been listening to U105 <laughs> or you've been on the radio uh, or you've been thinking about work or you've got that kind of scenario there where Patron had earlier on where the kids aren't doing great and work's really, really busy and you're thinking, what am I making for dinner tonight? 
And before you know it, you've plowed into the back of somebody or somebody stepped out in front of your car. So when you take responsibility for a vehicle, whether it be a car, a lorry, a van, whatever the case may be, think about it like a lethal weapon. Think about it like something that could actually cause severe injury to somebody else or could kill somebody else. So you've got to be 100% focused on your driving. That's the careless driving one. I remember my dad always said to me, remember you're driving a killing machine. And he's so right. Yeah. You know, and at the time I was like, I know dad, okay. But now I'm thinking about that for my children. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the kind of messages that we need to communicate to our children. Yeah. And and I've said earlier on, my son's 24. Like my son thinks he's a better driver than me. He genuinely thinks he's a better driver than me. And we debate this now. I'm an advanced driver, a police driver. I've been driving for X number of years. So there's something there about his attitude. And I can tell you that when I was 17 and I was 18, and I bet you we all thought we thought we were a great driver. Yeah. But 10 and 15 and 20 years later, you realise. And maybe there's this like curve where you... You improve as a driver and then maybe that curve goes back down again because we get a little bit careless in mm. terms of how much we focus. The seatbelt thing, it, it does amaze me still that people would think it's okay to drive a car without wearing a seatbelt. Um, and there, that, that scenario, by the way, that I read with those young people in a car, you know, that is not a new scenario. That happens on a very regular basis. Um, there were a number of collisions like that last year, particularly in, in the Republic of Ireland horrendous scenarios with three, four, five. There was one with seven or eight young people in the same vehicle. And in the, the stay off your phone one, you know, if you're looking at your phone, if you're touching your phone, if you're in any way taking your eyes off the road and putting your eyes onto your phone, a device, or even these modern cars that we have where you're flicking between your uh, radio, and then you're going to make a call and then you're going to listen to a podcast. And I listen to Audible a lot in the car and I have to take my eyes off the road to flick between phone and Audible. But in that second, imagine if you're doing 60 miles an hour, how much road you've, you've traveled and imagine the risks there. So I just want people to realize the fatal five are the main reasons why people are dying on the roads. I want you to recognize them and I want you to avoid them. And can I say, by the way, that, um, and I'll repeat what I said earlier on, when I hear somebody like Stephen talking, like, don't listen to me, folks. L listen to Stephen genuinely and listen to the consequences that this can bring to your door. And Stephen, my heart goes out to you and um, I think you'd, uh, you were a family of three, if I remember right, and your mum and stuff. Like, what a horrendous scenario. And that's the last thing that you want. So thank you, Stephen, for sharing that. And there are many, many other people who can share some of story. Thank, thank you again for the opportunity. Everyone. We might have a few questions for you from others, um, Sam, as well. So I just, you know, we'll, we want to play the little radio ad that U105 are, are running um, at the minute as well. But if anybody has a question, do you want to just put your hand up? Your, use your little hand. Or maybe while you're thinking about that. There's a few in the chat, Helen. Okay, great. Do you want to read them out to us, Marie? Okay, so uh, the first one is, what is PSNI's position on the use of sat-navs or mobile phones being used as sat-navs, e.g. Google Maps? When are they acceptable to be used in vehicles? Great question. Yeah, that's, that's dead easy. If your vehicle is completely stationary and you're putting in that you want to get from location A to location B, and you program it and you hit go, and your phone says, turn here, turn right here. No issues with that whatsoever. Um, don't get distracted by it. I, I, I drive a little Mercedes and the first thing it always warns you is when the screen comes on, do not be distracted. So if you're distracted by that uh, voice or by that map coming up on your screen, that's where you need to be really, really careful. But perhaps more importantly, if you're driving and you're trying to put in the fact that you're trying to get to the Odyssey, uh, the view here is tremendous, by the way, folks. If you're trying to get to the Odyssey and you're typing that in as you're driving, totally unacceptable. You're using an in inverted commas, a mobile phone, and it doesn't matter. The, the law doesn't talk about using it to make a call. The law talks about using it full stops. If you're using your phone and the police stop you, you will get it. Done. Okay. Another question it says, of the three E's, the enforcement for me is very important. Is there any plans to increase the police resource to this area? So I have to be careful and not become political at this moment in time. 
Um, but I'm, I'm coming up on 30 years in the organization. And the number of police officers that we have is, in my 30 years, at an all-time low. So um, the answer is, if we can get some kind of proper political settlement, if we can get um, an increase in our resources in the police service, there will absolutely be a desire to put more people into road policing roles. So last year, because of our budget, unfortunately, we had to take 21 officers out of road policing. And that was the same across various parts of the organization. Um, didn't do that because we wanted to, did it because we have to. But the one thing I will say is some, sometimes people think that it's only road policing officers that can enforce um, road safety. So local officers, and I did it as a constable and as a sergeant, operational. So in every single station, we still have police officers that are out on patrol, uh, still performing that role. But the short answer is with extra money and with extra resources, and therefore, with extra police officers, we will absolutely invest in this again going forward. Um, if you look at what's happened to some of the services in England and Wales, where they stripped away the, the number of uh, road safety officers that they had, and then their KSIs, KSI stands for killed and seriously injured, their KSI figures start to go back up again. So they tried to invest officers into things like um, cybercrime investigations, Road safety is always going to have to be a priority. So if you're talking to your local MLA or if you're talking to your local uh, MP, uh, do uh, lobby on our behalf and say you'd love to see more uh, police officers on the road. And I'd love to see the more I have, the more I will deploy. And do you think there's a correlation then between the rise in number that we see then whenever you, you talk about that's what happened in other parts of the UK? You know, I think, I think there's bound to be. So I wouldn't come on here today and say the reason that there was 71 last yeah. year is because there wasn't enough police officers. But it's bound to have an impact. But the reason why people are dying on our roads is not because they might the them. The reason is because people ignore the fatal five. Yeah. And this is all about driver behavior, driver attitude, recognizing risk. And I suppose if every single time you get into your vehicle, you, you told me earlier on, hell, about what your dad told you that that, that car was, it, when you get into that car, that van or that lorry, if you go, right, I am responsible for a vehicle. I'm going onto the road here with other road users, other drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists. I need to drive in a way that I'm going to protect myself because I want to get home safe. And I want to drive in a way that I can protect other people because I want other people to get home safe as well. So, so, so important. I mentioned earlier on about almost apologizing for enforcement. Um, and... Sadly, there are people who think that the only thing we do is enforcement. It's not. There's there's a world of education going on there in our schools and our colleges. And if your kids have been to the Road Safe Roadshow, which we do in partnership with the ambulance service and the fire service, it's scary when you see the consequences. And we'd like to do more of that. Yeah. And from an engineering perspective as well, we work with the Department for Infrastructure a lot. And if we can identify a road or particular part of a road or a junction that's not safe, we will work with them to try and correct that. And that's why you see some some roads changing. But I'm not going to apologize for enforcement. No. If you're going too fast or you're drink driving or you're on your phone and you get caught, I don't mean this rudely, but that's your issue and you need to face the consequences. Mm. And your staff need to face the consequences and your family need to face the consequences. So just don't do it. It's the plea. Good, good call. Um, and it would be remiss of me, um, Chris Conway, who is chief executive of TransLink. Yep. Um, he knows we're running this event today. Can't come along today, but he's got to watch back the video. But um, he was very keen for us to share the message that actually public transport is one of the safest methods of. I mean, they they, they can have accidents too, but it is one of the safest methods for people driving. And I suppose from a sustainability and responsible point of view, too, you know, we should always look and see is there a is there a public transport option for us. Um, so that we maybe get some of those cars off the roads too. There's another couple of questions here. Is drinking coffee whilst driving illegal? If not, how is this so? Interested in your opinion. Right. So you can give us your opinion and then you can give us what the legal situation is. Okay, so to answer the question bluntly, is drinking a coffee whilst driving illegal? No. There is no criminal offence or no road safety offence that says, thou shalt not, to use that kind of language, drink a coffee. This is where it becomes a little bit grey because careless driving is so broad that if you're eating an apple, I'm going to use a really silly example, or you're drinking a coffee, or you're doing something in a manner that you're so focused 
on that apple or so focused on that coffee that you're taking your eyes off the road. That can be careless driving. And I use the word can advisedly because it's all down to the individual circumstances. So it's all about, yeah, buy your coffee. And I like my coffee as much as anybody else. Buy your coffee, drink your coffee, but make sure that whilst you drink the coffee, that your focus and your priority is on driving the vehicle. Uh, now, the last thing I want, I'm going to get a call in about two weeks' time. I know this is going to happen. And it'll be somebody on a roadside who'll say, I've got the police here. And they said that I'm careless driving because I'm on, I'm driving and I'm drinking coffee. It's all down to the individual circumstances. Stay focused. Number three says, don't get careless. So stay focused and enjoy your coffee. Well, do you know what's happened to me actually is buying a coffee, you know, at a drive through and they hand it out to you and you put it in and you, you go to lift it and the lid comes off, yeah. you know, that that can just be a, a distraction for you. Another question for you here. Have there ever been discussions about the campaigns around the other end of speed and how driving too slow can also result in very dangerous driving? Thinking particularly for new or old driver, older drivers. So we've got people here in their R plates who are driving 45 miles on an hour on the motorway. Um, even things like N plates down south to mark newly qualified drivers. Well, we obviously have that with the, the restricted drivers, but is there an issue that you see on the roads with maybe somebody who's a bit older or a new driver who isn't driving as fast? Is that a patience thing on the behalf of the other drivers or or is that a risk? Yeah, so um, I'll give you a personal example. My father is, my father-in-law is 83 and he's still running a drapery business. And not that long ago, I was parked at a junction. The queue was horrendous. Uh, and I was trying to work out what the issue was. And along comes my father-in-law in his van uh, with the whole queue behind him. It's the way he drives. He's been driving like that for years, grew up in a local community. And there are lots and lots of people like that on our roads. But um, you said there, Helen, was it his fault or my fault? So when I was getting frustrated, sitting waiting to get out of that junction, that wasn't his fault. That was entirely my fault. So um, I would never, ever like to be quoted on saying people are driving too slowly. You can never drive too slowly. That, that's, just, that's just not possible. In fact, the slower you go, the safer you will be and the safer pedestrians or the road users will be. So just learn a little bit of patience. And, the last and also thing, leave early enough. I yeah. think that's that's one of the things that I find is, you know, I know I've got to be somewhere, so I'll just like to have that extra five minutes in the yeah. office, you know, actually just be a bit more organized to get out the yes. door. Because it's going to be five minutes on the other side. Yeah, because if it takes 26 minutes and you're sat now, which you programmed before you left, of course, tells you 26 minutes, then it's going to take you 26 minutes. Mm. Yeah, and we leave a little bit late. Now, um, to be real about that question as well, there are people on our roads who probably shouldn't be driving anymore. And there are, there are processes and pieces of legislation that allow us to take licenses off people. You have to be, um, you have to do your test so many times and you get to a certain age and stuff like that. And that's one thing that I would plead with sort of business owners. If you've got somebody who's driving for you as part of your business and you think, I'm not really sure they should still be driving anymore, talk to us. Um, we'll get somebody to do some kind of an assessment because the last thing you want is for that person to be involved in an accident and then go and, I wish I'd spoken to the police about that person because yeah. I wasn't really sure if they should be driving or not. And lots of us are in our 40s and 50s as well. And our parents have got to the stage now within their 70s and 80s. So if you think your parents shouldn't be on the road, then they probably shouldn't be on the road yeah. and get them some advice or a little assessment. Um, I'm involved in the Institute of Advanced Motorists and they do assessments. You can get your parents and your young people. Your son can do an uh, Institute of Advanced Motorists mm -hmm. assessment. Um, so get involved in things like that yeah. really 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 good. and always wear your glasses as well that was the other thing that we found out from talking to our health provider in work um that if you need glasses for driving always make sure you have them have a spare pair in the car or whatever never never be tempted to drive when you don't have your glasses on another question for you sam um i've noticed that often you get overtaken by drivers which go well over the speed limit and overtake near bends, and they always seem to get away with it. They're putting themselves and others at risk. Can the police do anything to detect these types of reckless drivers? So um, if I didn't see who sent that in, that would be my wife sending that one in, because my wife's always saying to me, I thought you were a police officer 24 hours a day, Sam. Can you not do something about that? So when I'm in my own vehicle and we're driving as a family, I see really, really terrible driving. And my wife will say, why can you not deal with that? Do you um, want to take it out there and then? Yeah, in your own car. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, first of all, 
I can't get out and stop someone there and then. Second of all, whilst I have observed something, I don't have the evidence to be yeah. able to take that to court. So we've been exploring for some time the possibility of dash cam footage being sent in, and the law now allows us to do that. Um, but we haven't quite launched that yet. And the reason we haven't launched it is we think we will be inundated. Yeah. And we simply don't have the resource now to deal with it. So when the time is right and we have the right resources uh, and we can progress, that we will do that sort of dash cam footage. Um, if somebody is driving so bad, I hasten to add, and you've got the type of car, you've got the registration, and, and you know what happened, and you can give us, you know, we can even ring 101 and, and, and give us a little bit of sense of what went on. There are occasions when we will go out and speak to people. Mm -hmm. It can be a little bit awkward. And I can think of one scenario many years ago when I went out and spoke to someone and they told me to get off their property because I had no evidence. So you have to be careful around that one. Yeah. But I can also think of a really good scenario where um, I went and spoke to someone about the, the driving standards and uh, the father, it was a girl driving the car at the time, and the father came to the door and said, I overheard the conversation. I've told you about your driving. You're banned from getting the car. So, you know, the message got through. So we have to yeah. be really, really careful about that. Yeah. But I suppose I would conclude by saying, Helen, if it's that bad, give us a call. Yeah. Give us a call on 101. You may be disappointed in that the police are not going to go out because it's very, very um, difficult. Mm -hmm. But at least we'll have it on record. Mm -hmm. And maybe the next time the same car is run through, we might make a decision to go. We'll not talk about that. AI and what people might do on that yeah. camp finish, so we'll, yeah. we'll not go there. Yeah. There's have, a lot of risk. Yeah, we have a few other um questions here. I'm just going to choose one last one, and then what I'd like to do is play the ad that U105 are going to be running. Um, a lot of people are asking for more information. Um, one uh, person has asked, you know, they manage a fleet of approximately 100 vehicles in Northern Ireland. So I mean, that's a that's a lot of drivers out there, um, a lot of vehicles out there. Is there the opportunity for the PSNI to come on site and give a similar briefing as to the one we've done today? Dark. Um, so again, resource might be. Yeah, but there's, there's two things there. First of all, you mentioned Chris Conway. I was down with Chris this morning. And uh, we're actually doing a little bit of training for the TransLink drivers as well, because from time to time, the buses have the old bump uh, and stuff like that. So we're, we've recorded videos and we've got messages that are being communicated to the bus drivers. So the short answer is, yes, we could do something like that. We're not going to do it for an organization that has a couple of drivers on the road. But if you've got, there's somebody there with a hundred drivers. Yeah. yeah, we'd love to get that opportunity. And if folks contact you, Helen, mm -hmm. you have my email yeah. address. And I'll get a road education officer to go out and brief the drivers, show them videos, talk about consequences and stuff like that. There are other organizations as well. So I've already mentioned the Institute of Advanced Motorists. So they do this kind of thing. Now they will charge you, the PS and I won't charge you because we're a public service, but the Institute of Advanced Motorists will do a program um, with your drivers and bring them up to that required standard. Um, uh, one quick, that just relates to that. One question is how much does it cost to get qualified as an advanced driver? I think when I looked on it, there was it was like under a hundred pounds to do the the test part of it. Yeah, I can't remember how much I paid, but it's in and around the hundred pounds yeah. mark. And it's yeah. If I was running a business and I had 20, 30, or 40 drivers on the road, I would invest in that. I would put them all through the IAM assessment. You get a couple of lessons, you do an assessment. And instead of driving like this, you know, looking at the road in front of you, you just become a different driver. You, yeah. You're looking at the road, you're thinking about risk all yeah, the time. Sure. And it's a really, really good way to improve the standard of driving in your business so there are a couple other questions um in the list what we'll do is when we send the information out to everybody tomorrow we'll make sure that we cover all the questions that you've asked so keep typing stuff in here we'll, we'll have a record of those and we'll try to cover as many um answers as we possibly can just conscious that we, we promise we would keep people here um and finish the webinar at three sam can i ask you to switch seats with peter for a second is that okay thank and you very much again thank you um Peter, just a couple of couple of minutes before we close here. Um, this is Peter McVerry, who's the station manager from U105. Peter, you're very committed to making sure that people are going to stay safe on the roads. And of course, um, we're allowed to listen to the radio whenever, we we're, whenever we're driving our cars. There's plenty of really good information in there. Tell us what you're you're doing at U105. Well, we've been a long-term supporter of road safety. We're a, a partner with Road Safe NI for the annual awards. It's the, the 10th anniversary of it this year and, and actually at the ninth event I sat next to Sam and we we're having a conversation Sam had just launched Fatal 5 then but they launched it through PR and through below the line because one thing as Sam's talked about there the PS and I don't have is resources so what we wanted to do was try to find a way in which we could help to support that 
as a responsible business. And what we decided we would do was to make a series of adverts. We in U105 have, have a quarter of a million people listening to us uh, for uh, more than two million hours each and every week. Um, within that, all of the people who are here you know, are able to listen, but we may have people who are fleet managers, we have people who are taxi drivers, we have people who are doing maintenance, we have people who are doing deliveries, you know, and, and, and all of those people are there as employees or employers, but they're also on there as parents and brothers and sisters and mums and dads. So what we've done is made an advert to promote the Fatal Five. What we plan to do through the, the rest of this year in the coming months is maybe more versions of that, where you may hear some versions in the coming months that focus on each of the five, but this one that Helen's about to play today will focus on the five, and we'll start to run that on U105 from this weekend, and you'll hear that over the coming days, weeks, and months, and you'll see it supported as well digitally. And what we wanted to try and do was encourage as many people as possible to, to, to heed that message. Hopefully when you're driving, you're listening to U105, you'll hear that message, and it'll be a short reminder of the things that you should do. And it'll also maybe give people, I'm buoyed by hearing that organisation who have 100 drivers and they want to get it. That's the sort of thing we as a business would like to do. If there's anything we can do as a radio station that will bring people together and will knit the PSNI and the organisation as a business community together, you know, a media organisation has the ability to do that and to bring people together and to, as a medium to get that message out very quickly and in an incisive you know, way, hopefully memorably in 30 seconds in the ad you're about to hear. So if there's anything that we can do to help any organisation out there to make their employees and themselves more safe, then I'm only too glad to hear from people on on X or on LinkedIn. Let's play your ad then. The fail- she said. The fatal five are the main reasons why people are dying on our roads. Ignoring these causes, devastating consequences for families and communities across Northern Ireland. For each of the fatal five, there's a rule to keep you safe. One, don't drink or take drugs and drive. Two, slow down. Three, don't get careless. Four, belt up. Five, stay off your phone. Be more than a statistic. Drive safe, get to know the Fatal Five and stay alive. Brought to you by the Police Service of Northern Ireland. So get your folks to listen out to the ads um, on U105. Um, make sure they're aware of what the Fatal Five are. Very clear from the, that ad. And our ask of you uh, who are attending today is to do that, listen out for the ads, but also tomorrow, whenever we send you the information, we're going to send you a direct link to the Police Service of Northern Ireland's website where you'll be able to get information on the Fatal Five. We'll also send you out some social assets that you can use, maybe in some of these ways that are listed here on your internal screens, newsletters, HR updates, out in your social media, get people to listen to the radio or share on your website or, or use them as posters around your offices. We hope that today has been useful for you. Thanks to all of our guests. Um, to Sam Donaldson from the Police Service of Northern Ireland, to Peter McVerry from U105, and uh, very much so to Stephen Kelly, who shared his personal experience with us. And stay safe out on the roads, everyone. Thanks for joining in.